together. All right. Tonight we are talking about an introduction to deliverance. And the last time we were together a couple weeks ago, we were talking about the authority of the name of Jesus. And we talked about the difference between power and authority. And we saw the authority that uh, God has placed in the name of Jesus. And that was really a very necessary teaching in order to keep rolling forward, for example, with what we're talking about tonight. Because tonight we're introducing you to the ministry of deliverance. And 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 says this, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now you know only a few Bible verses give us a specific reason why Jesus came, if you think about it. So whenever we see a verse like that, we should give it very careful attention. And this verse is one of them. That word destroy there means to loose, to undo or untie, like, like a shoelace, basically, or a rope. So think about it. That's what Jesus does for people, right? Isn't it? He unties them. He looses them, and that's awesome. Deliverance ministry looses people. It sets them free from demonic harassment through the power of Christ. Deliverance has been called the censored one-fourth of Jesus' ministry because people don't like to hear about it. They don't like to talk about it very much. But Jesus did so much of this kind of ministry that it really comprises about a fourth of his ministry in the Gospels. But as I said, for most people, it is a censored one-fourth. But uh, even if people should ignore it, you know, deliverance is very near to the heart of God because God loves to set people free. You know, when we call God or when we call Jesus, especially the Savior, what are we saying by that? We're saying that he saves people, that he rescues them. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus called deliverance the children's bread. In other words, it belongs to them. It's their birthright. Now, maybe you've heard people quote that and you say, as, as saying healing is the children's bed. But you know what? If you look at the text, in that story, when Jesus talked about um, the children's bread, in that story, Jesus was healing the child by casting out an unclean spirit. So sure, healing is the children's bread. But really, uh, in the story, what happened was that deliverance was the children's bread and birthright. Um, God doesn't want us to be bound by such things, and especially uh, his children. He feels very strongly about that. Let's look at the believer's authority over demons tonight and how to deliver them through the power of Christ. Jesus said, in my name, they shall cast out demons. And that's a great promise. Amen. So I hope, I hope you did have some protein tonight. Maybe you brought a Slim Jim or a protein bar with you because we will have to put on our thinking caps a few times tonight. Some of this will, will run a little deep, but it's good stuff. I always encourage you to go back, go through the notes, do your own Bible study on these passages, watch the video again uh, afterwards. Um, sometimes it's a good thing to do as well. But let's start by talking about the Christian's authority to cast out demons. First thing we need to know is that Jesus was anointed to free the captive. Jesus saw his mission as being one of liberation. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus said that he was fulfilling the famous prophecy from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, that was a prophecy about what the Messiah would do. And Jesus said, quite publicly, that he had come to fulfill it. And in fact, they knew exactly, if you remember the story, Jesus, uh, when Jesus said that, that he had come to fulfill that, they knew exactly what he was claiming to do and be, and they tried to kill him for it. Um, as we've said before, earlier on in the course, Peter summarized Jesus' ministry probably differently from the way that you and I might summarize it today. Today, you know, people like to emphasize Jesus' teachings, but Peter knew, of course, that that was only just part of the story. Peter said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, that's our favorite word, dunamis again, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was 
with him. So to Peter, that is something that really stuck out as being one of the main things that Jesus did. He went around healing people who were being oppressed by the devil. Deliverance was an essential component of Jesus' ministry. So, as I said, a quarter, one-fourth or more of his ministry involved casting out demons. And that, in turn, resulted in spiritual and physical healing. And it also made the good news of the kingdom spread like wildfire. So, uh, 1.2. The power of Messiah at work means God is at work. So, Jesus said that his works of power and his authority over demons demonstrated some important things. First, it demonstrated that the kingdom of God had come. That God was offering, God was presenting and offering his kingdom to people. Jesus said in Matthew 12, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. It also demonstrated, his authority demonstrated who he was. Jesus said, If I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you don't believe me, believe the works so that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. And then later on in John's gospel, he said, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The, work, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. And Jesus' authority also demonstrated that the arrival of the kingdom was, was calling for an appropriate response from people, namely repentance and faith. You know, when God shows up in power right in front of you, you don't get to be neutral about that. You have to make a decision. I don't find too many people being neutral eh, about Jesus, right? Right? You know, Jesus causes somebody's arm to grow out or casts out a bunch of demons. What people did not say after that was, eh, I could kind of take or leave this Jesus guy. We read in Mark 1, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching uh, the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, so this is Jesus' message, okay, at the beginning of his ministry, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So when God shows up and does something publicly in front of you, God is also calling you, inviting you, really commanding you, to repent and believe in him because of what you've seen. And if you don't respond to what God is doing before your very eyes, your heart gets hardened to that. And it'll become harder to reach you for God. 1.3, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. That's what Jesus said in John 20. So in that verse, he is setting forth not only the heart of the mission, but he's also setting forth the activity of our mission. So for the same purposes that the Father sends Jesus, the Father would love to send you in Jesus' name. So our mission is not merely to demonstrate his love, which a lot of people, anybody can sign off on that, right? Like, oh, we're here to love like Jesus loved. That, who's going to disagree with you when you say something like that? Yes, but our mission is also to demonstrate his works, and that's because only doing Jesus' works gives people a full demonstration of who he is. The world has to see the power of the Messiah to set people free. When the Spirit's power is released through the name of Jesus, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, that demonstrates that there is authority, that God has placed authority in Jesus' name. And it proves that God has glorified Jesus, elevated him to be the Lord in Christ. In other words, uh, the power of Jesus' name is proof that the gospel, proof that Christianity is true. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So it's a challenging question, right, for you and me. Uh, is there anything in my life that demonstrates the Spirit's presence and power at work? 
either in my own life or through my life to help somebody else. And if not, what is the reason for that powerlessness and what am I going to do about it? Jesus trained and also commissioned the church to expel demons. 1.4. In addition to his own ministry of deliverance, which was so powerful, Jesus gave his authority over demons to the church through his name. He first commissioned the 12, then he commissioned the 70, and after his resurrection, he authorized and he commissioned all believers to continue that ministry of deliverance. So Luke chapter 9 is when he sends out the 12 on their own for the first time. He called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then in Luke chapter 10, he sent out 70. And it says that the 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. But then uh, as part of uh, the Great Commission or as part of um, Jesus' instructions to his disciples after his resurrection and before he ascended back to the Father, Jesus extends his ministry of power to the entire church. In Mark 16, we read, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. So, Notice how Jesus removes there, he removes any suggestion that there is this limited grant of authority. In other words, Jesus did not limit this ministry to the 12 or to the 70. He didn't limit it to a certain time frame like, well, you know, the first century. This will only work in the first century. Once it gets to the year 101, you guys are on your own, right? Thank God he didn't say that. Instead, Jesus authorized the whole church to carry on his mission of expelling demonic invaders. And in fact, 1.5, the church did carry on Jesus' powerful deliverance ministry in the book of Acts and continued to do so in the early centuries of the church. So right from its inception, right from the get-go, the church carried on a powerful ministry of deliverance and that tremendously propelled evangelism because evangelism needs to be more than just verbal content there has to be a demonstration of the spirit's power be it in revelation be it in healings be it in deliverance the power of God must be seen as well so we have this quote from Acts 8 and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip in other words they paid attention to Philip why hearing and seeing the miracles which he did For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. I guess so. So the effect of that, as you could see, was electric, just as it had been in the ministry of Jesus. And continuing on several centuries, in the first few centuries after the time of Jesus, I want to tell you that casting out demons was perhaps the main ingredient in evangelism. Believe it or not. So don't, don't look at me cross-eyed. Uh, I want you to think this through with me. So um, perhaps you're aware that people debate, historians debate, it's, it's a kind of a head-scratcher for them. How exactly was it that the church was able to Christianize, you want to use that word, how did the church Christianize the Roman Empire? There is a famous historian at Yale University, uh, not a Christian believer as far as I know, a professor named Ramsey McMullen. Uh, he just died actually a couple of years ago. And Ramsey McMullen, the, the American Historical Society, named him the greatest living historian of the Roman Empire. Okay, So when the other historians gather around and say, he's the guy, then he's the guy. Now, Professor McMullen, and remember, okay, he was considered the greatest historian of the Roman Empire. He claimed that the single greatest factor in the Christianizing of the Roman Empire was the casting out of demons. That's how important that was to evangelization. Now, few people talk about this, 
But for hundreds of years after Christ, Christian leaders spoke very boldly and spoke very publicly about the ability of regular ordinary Christians to cast out demons and do miraculous signs. Uh, one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, now Tertullian died in the year 220, and he said that the greatest proof of Christianity was the truth of God's word, but he said that the second greatest proof of our faith was the testimony of the demons who have been conquered by Christ. Isn't that amazing? Because imagine, you're living in a society, now you're not seeing it here, at least usually not overtly, right? Heavily demonized people, because they're often, well, they're just frankly often locked away. So unless you're in traffic, you usually won't see <laughs> heavily demonized people. But if you're in a society in which heavily demonized people are there, in society and can often be triggered by different things and you're encountering these sometimes dangerous people all the time and there are people in that society who have an ability to deal with it that nobody else has that will cause the society to listen to those people and those people will have an impact and Tertullian said that the the second greatest uh, proof of our faith next to the word of God itself was the testimony of the demons who were being driven out so Tertullia, in his, uh, one of his works, The Apology, he writes this. He says, let a demoniac therefore be brought into court. In other words, hey, um, you guys, as we're here in our debate series, he was saying, uh, anybody got like a really like demonic person? Any demonic persons in the house? He says, let a de demoniac be brought into court and the spirit which possesses him be commanded by any Christian to declare what he is and he shall confess himself to uh, he shall confess himself as truly to be a devil as he did falsely before profess himself a god. So Tertullian says, "You bring me right here. You bring us Christians right now, any demonized person, and we will cast this spirit out of him because these spirits are telling you that they're gods." We will cast the spirit out of this person right now, and we will force it to confess that it is not a god, but that it's an evil spirit. That's confidence, but they had the results. And the historians of the Roman Empire know that this was the reason, the real reason why the empire was Christianized because of evangelism that was conducted in the power of the spirit and casting out demons through the name of Jesus. And this still, still goes on today uh, in many places around the world. All right, let's talk about some common terms in deliverance ministry. What do we mean, after all, by deliverance anyway? Well, deliverance is simply setting people free from demonic influence. That can involve expelling demons out of a person's life, as well as breaking the grip of behaviors that are giving the demons access to that person's life. Um, 2.2, I would say that we, what we want to do is avoid using the term exorcism. Avoid using the term exorcism. Now, uh, exorcism is a biblical term. I want to be clear about that. In Acts chapter 19, the Bible talks about these uh, sons of Sceva who were defeated by demons. It calls them exorcists. However, we want to avoid using the term exorcism because exorcism refers to practices that are used by unbelievers and sometimes even uh, practices that employ demons themselves. The Bible never uses the word exercise or exorcism when it is talking about Christian deliverance ministry. Okay, you, are you with me on this? So forget Hollywood, forget you know exorcist movies and things like that. Hopefully you don't go to see those kinds of movies. But the Bible doesn't use that word in talking about Christian deliverance ministry. The word exorcism it literally meant to bind someone with an oath. And it implies the use of rituals that Christians should not use. And frankly that Christians don't need. So even to this day a pagan exorcism... Uh, can often involve summoning new demons to deal with the demons that are already there, that are already present and tormenting an afflicted person. So by contrast, 
Jesus said that believers in him would cast out demons. And Jesus used a completely different word there, ekbalo, which simply means to throw out. Ek means out, balo means to throw, and that's ultimately where we even get our word ball, you know, like that you play with. So Jesus' ministry of deliverance and the ministry of deliverance that the church had after Jesus returned to the Father were shocking. You see, up until that point, until Jesus came, no one had ever seen a person with the authority to cast out demons just with a word of command. You will not even find prophets or anybody else uh, casting out demons in the Old Testament. It's just not there. In Luke chapter 4, let me read you this piece from when Jesus went to Capernaum. We read this, Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching because his word was with authority. Now, in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown, them in, uh, thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word, and that means word or teaching a message, what a word or message this is, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. We should also avoid the terms possessed and possession. Now, if you were with me in that when I was teaching uh, in the cleansing stream class last week, this, this will be a little bit of review for you because you've just heard me talk about these issues a little bit in cleansing stream. But we should also avoid the terms possessed and possession for a couple of reasons. First, possession implies that demons own a person. And that is hard to justify biblically, especially when the afflicted person is a Christian. Um, second, the word possession is not really a faithful translation of the Greek and the New Testament. Here's why. The word that the Bible uses, and, and this is where I said I hope you put your thinking cap on with me tonight. The word that the Bible uses to talk about people who have demons is this word daimonizomai. And English Bibles translate this as possess. But that really isn't accurate because in Greek, that simply means to have a demon. So we could also render that in English by saying that someone is demonized. So if, you, if English is not your native language, uh, if you are a Spanish speaker, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because in, in Spanish, you would tend to say en diablado, which just means he has a demon, right? So English Bibles, though, use this expression possessed a dozen or so times and daimonizomai is usually the word that's there. Um, the other times the writer uses a word that just means to have. So in the New Testament, people are demonized or they have demons or are held by demons. That's what the Greek says. So um, what I want to say to you is it's not really correct in modern English to say that someone is possessed by a demon. It's not really the best biblical language to use. So here's why, another reason why. Uh, remember that words change their meaning over time, over centuries. And today we use the word possess in English uh, differently than the way that they used it back 400 years ago when they translated the King James Bible. So in those days, in the English of that era, when you said someone was possessed with demons, that simply meant that he had demons. It doesn't mean that he was possessed or owned by them. Are, are you tracking with me? So this, this will help uh, some of you. If you may have heard this word used this way in other contexts. So we used to say more, more formal English back in the day, we would have said that a man was possessed of great wealth. Or we might have said that a woman was possessed of great beauty. 
Now that has become kind of old fashioned English. And as a result, I think this has caused us to be a little bit confused about what the Bible's telling us about demons. So, so if I said a man was possessed of great wealth, that, that means he had wealth. It doesn't mean the wealth had him. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So it's a little tricky, but this has been a very unfortunate um, this is a very unfortunate translation in the English language, and not every language has this problem. Certainly from a pastoral standpoint, when we are ministering to someone who is being afflicted by demons, it is a lot better and a lot easier to minister to people uh, by saying that they are being harassed by demons or that they are afflicted by demons and it is certainly uh, a lot less degrading to a person than rather than telling someone that he is possessed and you know I mean I've run into somebody who you know I remember somebody saying oh my pastor says I'm possessed so um, you know you put this, this label on someone and it, it keeps them from thinking about what's happening to them in a biblical way so all right, let's move on from there to the uh, very light topic of demons in the human person. So, all right, um, where do demons reside? I'm in section three here. The Bible does teach that demons can inhabit people, but it's hard to say. It's hard to say, perhaps in a given case, do they dwell in the body, the soul, or the spirit? Uh, many Christians reject the idea that demons can live in a Christian because believers are temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, not to be too cute, but I would uh, point out perhaps that, you know, being the temple of the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to stop a lot of Christians from sinning. But what do I know, right? Uh, I don't think it's unbiblical to suggest that Christians can be demonized as long as we're being clear about what that means. I want to tell you, uh, certainly from experience, it would be naive to think that Christians cannot be harassed or influenced by demons, especially uh, in light of the warnings that the Bible gives us about the enemy's activity. Uh, when demons are not inhabiting a human being, what are they doing? Well, they may seek to inhabit other living creatures. It seems that demons don't enjoy being unclothed, unclothed by a body, so to speak. And Jesus supports that idea when Jesus says that uh, these demons try to re-enter somebody after they have been expelled. And the Lord says that demons view a human body as a house and that they are restless if they're not covered by, some, by something. So, but let's remember that it is much more important to be able to address these situations uh, than to debate them. I would rather be able to address the situation and help somebody rather than have an intellectual debate about what is happening inside of this person's life. All right, so how do demons gain access to a person's life anyway? This is another subject about which the Bible does not say as much as we would like. The Bible assumes, I think when we talk about these situations, the Bible assumes that these people already know something. The people who were receiving the Bible already knew something about demons because it was a part of life. Um, so Bible teaching, certainly, and experience will give us some insight. Uh, demonic influence can come about in a variety of ways. So the key is really to be aware of events or aware of behaviors that are going to put people at risk of demonic influence or uh, behaviors that can hinder a person from receiving ministry so that they can become free. So let's talk about some of these things. These are not pleasant, but we have to work through this list. How do demons gain access to a person's life? Uh, well, first it can come about through invitation. Uh, that is probably pretty rare, but some people certainly do deliberately invite demonic spirits to enter them. A demonic uh, attack can come about through idolatry. Scripture says that the gods of the Gentiles are actually demons. And so therefore, if people are worshiping gods other than the Bible, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you are at risk of demonization for that very reason itself. It can also happen through heredity. 
So it is possible for demonic influences to be transmitted through a person's bloodline because these demonic spirits are part of, are part of that family worship, the family's culture. People who serve demons or false gods will often seek to seal that allegiance and worship and sense of ownership, if you will, in their children and will often try to initiate their children into that worship as well. And along with that will come a demonic infestation. Occult involvement, and we, we talk about this in, in some length um, in Cleansing Stream, but occult involvement. Anyone who engages in occult practices or if you possess occult objects, uh, you are at risk of demonic harassment. So uh, we always advise people, look, go through your house, pray through your house, ask the Holy Spirit to show you anything that's there that you should not own or that you should not have in your house from maybe your life before you knew the Lord or maybe some practices that you used to engage in. Demonic activity can come through the effects of a curse. So a curse or a spell can release demonic workings, often called assignments. You might hear people use that term, a demonic assignment, uh, into the lives of people who are targeted by it. Sexual perversion frequently opens people up to demonic um, bondage. And all sexual experience outside of marriage, you know, which the Bible calls fornication, must be avoided. Drug use is another avenue, and a lot of people don't understand that this is the case, but drugs are often used to open people up to spiritual experiences, especially now. Uh, nowadays, there's been such a resurgence of people taking uh, and promoting hallucinogenic drugs. Hallucinogenic drugs seem to override the normal defenses in a person's will. They eliminate or weaken the barriers and the safeguards that God has placed in our souls, in our minds, to keep us from having this easy and constant interaction with the spiritual realm, right? So uh, when people take ayahuasca and take these hallucinogens, what happens? They have these very profound spiritual experiences in which they're in contact with these strange gods and beings and so forth. Uh, drug addiction uh, can certainly be worsened and strengthened by demonic activity. Uh, soulish witchcraft. So witchcraft is, um, when I tell people, when you think of witchcraft, don't immediately think of somebody with green skin and a pointy hat and a pointy nose, okay? It's not what witchcraft is. Witchcraft, the Bible says, is actually a work of the flesh, just like lust and anger and all these other things. It might surprise you in Galatians 5 to see witchcraft listed as a work of the flesh. And that tells us that it is simply a normal tendency that all of us have in our fallen human flesh. Very interesting. We all have a tendency towards manipulation, intimidation, and a desire to control others. But see, what happens is that desire to manipulate and control others can become demonically empowered. And then all kinds of trouble can come from that bad root. Um, religiosity also can open a door for the demonic. Intensely zealous religious people who give themselves over to religious rituals and practices that are not of God, they can certainly open themselves up to uh, the motivations and controls of religious spirits. Unforgiveness. Uh, we deal with this all the time in deliverance ministry. Uh, few sins are as crippling to the entire person, the whole man, the whole woman. Few sins are as crippling as unforgiveness. So I, I call it the devil's playground. Violence. Um, of note in our society, I believe, uh, watching violence, glamorizing it, certainly participating in it, can invite demonic influence. And you should... Uh, a red flag always, and many of you will know this, of course, but uh, in a person's life, in, in a child's life, you should be especially alert for physical cruelty, right, to animals or uh, to people. That's a red flag for potential future problems. Wrath, uh, giving place to outbursts of wrath or hatred may also invite spirits of anger. And all other kinds of carnal indulgence of lots of different kinds can become demonically empowered. Uh, alcohol and drug addiction, of course, would be in that list. But also things like um, gluttony and, and laziness. It's, it's interesting that God in the Bible talks about a spirit of stupor 
coming on people. Like when people, when people become senseless and just dull and they have no energy and they just become lazy. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, abuse and trauma. So people who are physically or sexually abused can become demonized. Now, there can be a lot of different mechanisms at work here. Um, persons who have experienced physical traumas, terrifying events or shocks, they can become weakened in their soul to the extent that they cannot really resist uh, demonic invasion or attack. Uh, and when that happens, we can find that spirits of fear or spirits of grief will then cripple the person's life. Now, don't misunderstand what I just said there because I am not saying, and this doesn't mean that the victim is to blame for the situation. That's not what I'm saying. But the events that the person suffers can cause the person to believe the enemy's lies about himself. Does, does that make sense? When people are traumatized, when they're abused like that, one of the cruel things that the enemy does is then use that thing to, uh, that e those events to lie to the person about their life. And those lies become part of the person's self-image and they really can cut the person off from God's message of life and hope that he is actually wanting to speak to that person. Diagnosing demonic behavior, 3.3. Um, are you doing okay with this? You need to like exhale when you hear this uh, litany of woe. It's like not very pleasant. But um, a lot of demonic behavior is easy to identify. Uh, and the Gospels do show us some obvious signs of demonic activity. Uh, other signs are more subtle. So here is a partial list of things which could indicate demonic harassment. Now, um, a lot of times people will come to us as the pastors and say, you know, I think I need deliverance. And that's a process of, of discernment uh, in which we really need to go to the Lord and see if there really is a demonic problem or not. Because just because you have a problem in your life doesn't mean that the problem is demonic. But sometimes it is. And sometimes it's demonic and it's also uh, our discipleship, our growth, our, our flesh that's involved. So there really is a process of discernment. But these things uh, may indicate demonic harassment. So uh, an inability to control your thought life. So, uh, for example, impure thoughts, fearful thoughts, irrational hatreds and mental constructs. Now, when I'm talking about these things, I'm not talking about this, this happens to you once in a while. I'm talking about these are things that are ongoing in your life. Uh, B, inability to control emotions or sensations, hatred, self-pity, silliness, flightiness. So when people are constantly in something like that, uh, restlessness, exhaustion, inability to focus. Uh, D, compulsive behaviors. E, fascination with or attraction to darkness and the occult. That's a very big red flag. So moms and dads, when you ever see that there is a, it's almost like a switch gets flipped in your child and all of a sudden everything changes, the atmosphere of your kid, his mood, sort you can almost see it sitting on him and then all of a sudden he's dressing differently, he's talking differently, he wants to like do over his bedroom differently and all of this, you can see this glamorization of evil and focus on the occult. Uh, F, erratic, inappropriate and untimely behavior. G, unexplained changes in personality or morality. You sometimes see a person spiral, right? Very quickly go spiraling, let's say, into promiscuity or all kinds of sin, depending on what it is. H, blasphemy. Letter I, an aversion to holy things, such as the word of God, the name of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit in worship, and also holy Christians. So many, many times in church, we've had people run out because they can't stand being in the worship. They get uncomfortable, they don't like the worship, and they actually have to leave the sanctuary. Um, J, extreme religiosity and devotion to religious rituals or uh, attraction to strange and unusual beliefs and doctrinal error. Uh, L, profanity and an attraction to uncleanness in general. Do you remember in the Gospels? Where were some of these uh, demonized people? Where were they hanging out? In cemeteries, among the tombs, this kind of thing. You're drawn to filth and uncleanness and death. Mockery and cruelty, frequent lying, 
Uh, oh, sexual licentiousness, promiscuity, and seductive behavior, sexual perversions and compulsions. Uh, P, we see very common in our society, right? Self-harm, self-destructive behavior, suicidal tendencies, social withdrawal. Uh, some of the things we see in the Gospels, like in r &S, supernatural knowledge or skills and supernatural strength. Uh, T, persistent patterns of destructive or self-sabotaging behavior, unexplained bizarre incidents or frequent accidents in a person's life or in a family. Uh, and those things can often indicate the workings of a curse. Persistent and or difficult to explain illnesses and uh, other overt supernatural manifestations and phenomena. So just because something like this happens to somebody or you're sick, you have an illness, whatever it is, or there's something on this list that has popped up, again, that does not mean that there is a demonic problem. But when a person persistently has these things operating in their lives or they're mired in them or it becomes a compulsion and they can't stop, you have to question. So uh, observation is useful, but Demonic activity really is best diagnosed by the Holy Spirit and then confirmed through prayer. Um, so a lot of demonic activity is diagnosed really by revelation through the Spirit. Um, he might give a word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, or some other thing. Really, it's, it's, it's a decision led by the Spirit that the people ministering have to make whether or not to treat it uh, as a demonic issue. So... Remember that while some illness is demonic, most illness probably is not. And the Gospels recognize that, right? So in the Gospels, there is such a thing as a spirit of infirmity. But not all sickness is caused by a spirit of infirmity. Sometimes Jesus healed a person, right? But other times Jesus cast out of a person a spirit of infirmity, and that caused the person to be healed when that demon left. Now, a lot of the behaviors that I just lifted, listed above in that horrible list, those things started, listen, those things started as moral failings. They started as moral failures long before they became demonically empowered. And they became demonically empowered because people kept giving themselves over to those sins over and over again. Do you understand that? There's, there's kind of a dynamic there. And in the same way, a lot of what we nowadays have come to call mental illness has nothing to do with demonic spirits. But it could be a matter of brain chemistry, right? You know, your brain is an organ, right? I mean, someone who has a problem with their heart, we would pray for their heart. If someone has a problem with their liver, we would pray for their liver. But not all mental illness is demonic. And it's very interesting in the Gospels, um, sometimes Jesus, for example, if a person had epilepsy, Jesus prayed for them to be healed. But on other occasions, he dealt with epilepsy as a spirit. So you have to operate with the discernment of the Holy Spirit to know what you're praying for and how to pray. In other words, um, people nowadays would say, oh, well, those ancient people, they were unsophisticated. They didn't understand science. And so they blamed everything on demons because they didn't know any better. Yeah, no, that's not what the gospel says. Uh, the gospel, uh, even 2,000 years ago, showed us that people understood some illness, even some mental illness or situations were demonic, and some was not. Which goes back to what we said when we were talking and training about praying for the sick. You have to hear, you have to have a living word from the Holy Spirit to guide you as to how to pray for a person in a particular case. And the enemy, of course, takes advantage of all of those unfortunate situations. Uh, let's talk for a minute about these uh, demonic assignments. Demons can actually be sent uh, against people by occult practitioners in order to accomplish certain things. And that is actually one way that a curse can operate in a person's life. So curses do not work through some kind of magical power, right? Forget, you know, Disney. Again, there's not like, you know, a, a green-skinned woman with a pointy hat who's, you know, has magical power that she can do something. But curses work through demonic power. And related to that idea, the Gospels show us that 
demons can specialize. Demons can specialize in how they work in people. Now, some Christians have a hard time with that, but all you have to do to understand that is simply read the Gospels. If you read the Gospel, you'll see the Bible clearly states that there are such things as spirits of deafness, of blindness, spirits of muteness, spirits of insanity, spirits of witchcraft and epilepsy and fear. So we have to be careful not to leave any open doors or holes in our armor, as we like to say, that the enemy can take advantage of. Because if he can take advantage of it, he will. Christians, as, as Christians, guys, we are the targets of the enemy. We are the targets of the curses of the enemy's servants. And so we have to be careful, as the Bible says, to give him no place. Give him no room. Don't give him a foothold. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Look, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul is saying if you allow unforgiveness in your church, if you allow unforgiveness in your personal relationships, you are giving the devil something that he can take advantage of. He will use that unforgiveness in your life to become something that will introduce torment into your life. All right, let's talk about expelling demons, which is the happier part of this. Uh, first, some pastoral considerations. So uh, in any deliverance session, the main consideration is, is the dignity, the welfare and the dignity of the person who's afflicted. And if we are the ministers of Christ, we have to reflect his character. Scripture says that Jesus would not break a bruised reed. In other words, he's gentle with people. And so for that reason, certainly here in our church, we don't consider it necessary to perform uh, demonstrative deliverances. If there's a deliverance, uh, unless we really have to do it for some reason, we're not going to do it, you know, up in front uh, of the altar, in front of everybody on a Sunday morning uh, with lots of screaming and drama. Because, you know, in most cases, people can maintain a normal life despite some degree of demonic influence or harassment. And so we prefer usually to schedule a deliverance prayer session for people, which just allows for a, a warmer and calmer environment with some pre-selected people who are prepared to minister to people in God's love and power. Preparation is important. Jesus taught, after all, that there are some cases that are hard cases. And for that reason, it's wise for the ministry team to be fasting ahead of a deliverance session. Fasting is a means to obtain strength and obtain revelation. Uh, it doesn't really have any merit of its own. It's not magical, except what it does do is it forces us to cast ourselves upon the Lord and get our strength from him. It is uh, wise to give some directives to a person ahead of time when you're going to be ministering to that person so that the person will know what to expect. Now, sometimes when you're ministering to a person like this, um, they have a background that makes it very obvious as to what you might be dealing with. So if a person's been engaged in witchcraft, right, then that presents us with some obvious areas for prayer. Uh, some people like to use questionnaires and kind of go through a whole inventory of spiritual practices and ask the person, have you ever been involved in this or that, and ask them about their family history. Uh, some people don't like to rely on those things. I don't like to rely on those things. I know Pastor Ruth doesn't like to rely on those things when we pray for people that way because we kind of uh, we kind of don't want to go into a prayer session like that knowing too much about the person because we want to get a, a word from the Holy Spirit as to how uh, to pray, if that makes sense. Uh, I would say the ideal team is on the small side. It's small-ish. You don't want to overwhelm the person who's receiving ministry, right? Jesus, remember, Jesus sent people out in twos. He didn't send people out, you know, in twelves to dive, dive bomb people. So uh, a group of maybe two experienced persons and one learner, let's say, is a good size, probably about as big as you would want to use. Uh, we also like to have another person, uh, when we can, be there just to lend prayer support. They, in other words, they're just 
interceding for the ministry that's happening. They're not participating directly in the deliverance itself. Uh, authority is important to your unity. So there should be one person who's clearly in charge. And if you're ministering together uh, in deliverance, you should certainly be in agreement among yourselves. You should be at peace among yourselves and so forth and just be united in your purpose. Uh, when should you not proceed? And I think we've, we've talked about this before, but you know, to get the benefit of a deliverance session, a person has to be willing to repent uh, and repent of and give up all known sin. And we have had this happen here where, you know, a person, we starting out and we're talking about forgiveness and say, okay, uh, what about forgiving that person? It's like, no, I don't want to forgive them. And it's like, well, okay, sorry, well, we're done here. <laughs> that kind of ends the deliverance session right there. Because if the person is not willing to forgive uh, and so forth, then... You can't, you can't really proceed because you're not actually helping the person. You, you never expel uh, demons against a person's will. Jesus taught us about this, that a person whose house, this house, right? A person whose, whose house is not filled with the Holy Spirit can find those demons returning and find them returning in greater numbers. That is not my opinion, guys. That is not my opinion. That is what Jesus taught. So I've had it happen in this church. Somebody came up to me and said, Pastor Nick, you know what? Um, So-and-so has demons. And I said, I know. <laughs> and then the person said, okay, well, why don't you cast it out of him? I said, well, I can't because I, if I do, I'm not doing him any favors because I know that once we do this, I know he's only going to go to the girly bar on Friday night. You, you tracking with me there, right? So it's like, I'm not doing the person a favor if the person is going to run back to the same sin that's getting him in trouble because he's going to be worse off afterwards than he was before. So steps to freedom. What does this look like? First, uh, ask God for help. That's always good. But it's so obvious that you may forget. So as we begin a prayer session, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. We ask for God's wisdom. We ask the Lord to protect us and give us the ministry of his angels. Uh, as much as possible, I would say, be in an atmosphere of praise and worship. You can play some appropriate music or people can worship the Lord. And it's just a way to uh, make the presence of the Lord be more manifest in the room. Um, it's a good idea to encourage the person that Christ can and will set him free, but that he has to want to be free. You know, it is amazing but true. Um, you might not have uh, dealt with this in your, own, uh, in your own experience, but certainly every pastor knows that some people are quite fond of their sin and they don't want to give it up. Do you remember that even Jesus said to people, what do you want me to do for you? Interesting question, right? So uh, number four, we seek to have the person repent of all known sin, or certainly if he's not a Christian, you have to seek to lead him to Christ. And that will help tremendously because then the person can cooperate with you in their own deliverance. You know, one of the most powerful weapons that we have against the enemy is our own personal righteousness. Do you remember that Jesus said, uh, the prince of this world is coming, Jesus said, but he has nothing in me. Right? Isn't that awesome? Jesus, there was nothing in Jesus' life that the devil could get at and, and use for any purpose. So the most effective deliverances really are those in which the person we're praying for does as much self-deliverance as possible. And so that makes the environment a lot, a lot less confrontational and more comfortable for the person. So when the person repents and when the person recommits his or her life to Christ, that will deprive the enemy of the legal grounds that the enemy's been using to gain access to that person's life and afflict her. But if a person is not willing to receive Jesus as Savior, uh, it's very difficult. And I would say do not proceed with your deliverance session. You can just pray blessing over them. Pray that the Lord will lead them to repentance. Now, if you were here in our prayer meeting 
when we were praying for America a couple nights ago, you heard me mention this, so I apologize, but when, when I am ministering in deliverance, I always address, I always address five specific areas in which we know that sin can open a door in a person's life for demonic influence, or it can open them up to the effects of a curse. And those five things are harboring unforgiveness in your heart, shedding innocent blood, occult practices, drug and alcohol abuse, and sexual sin. So in, in each of those cases, and anything else that the Holy Spirit brings to mind, we, we have the person renounce sins in general, and then we have them list specific instances. For example, uh, if a person is harboring unforgiveness against somebody, he should say so, and then verbally forgive that person, and ask God to forgive them for that sin of unforgiveness, of holding that thing against that person. The Holy Spirit may then uh, suggest other names or other relationships when unforgiveness uh, has been an issue. And it's so beautiful when you do this with somebody, how much that frees the person, how much that unlocks the person. It's so beautiful to see the Holy Spirit working with us and, and helping us. I, I was in a deliverance session and somebody, one of the other ministers who was ministering to this person with us, it wasn't me, it was, uh, it was actually a, a woman that was assisting with us. Um, the Holy Spirit gave her a name and said to this woman that we were praying for, does the name, I don't know, we'll pick a name, Jane, does the name Jane mean anything? And the woman like reacted like that and said, that's the name of a woman that my husband had an affair with and nobody knows about it except my husband and me but the Holy Spirit knew. So you see, when the Holy Spirit gives a word of knowledge like that, it's so powerful because number one, it shows that God knows us. He knows us in such a beautiful way and he knows all about us. Number two, it shows how greatly he loves us. He didn't reveal that name to my fellow pastor to embarrass or humiliate that woman, but because there was grace from God then for this woman to be able to forgive that other woman and be set free from this torment of, of unforgiveness and so forth. So um, I, I tell stories like that because I want you to see that this is not a scary ministry. It's not always pleasant, to be sure, um, and it gets very real, but it's not a scary ministry. It's a beautiful ministry when you see th God do things like that for people but if the person again refuses to forgive someone you you can't proceed any further because the person now is not walking in righteousness and you will not be able to close that door to the enemies working in that person's life Are you with me on that as far as shedding innocent blood um, you may say well I can't imagine there's enough of a lot of that going on, but, but yes, uh, there's a tremendous amount of that, and people should repent of all involvement with murder, killing, and abortion, whether they underwent a voluntary abortion themselves, whether they performed or assisted in one, or paid for one, or helped other people procure an abortion. Participation in abortion, whether as a, a mother, a father, a, a, a person who performs or someone who helps procure an abortion, that will bring a curse because it involves the shedding of innocent blood. Now, if that applies to you tonight, please uh, know that Jesus offers you mercy, forgiveness, healing, and peace. And the Bible says that he will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Where there's been occult involvement, we ask the person to, to verbally renounce that involvement. You know, there's a, a positive act of our will is necessary to open these doors, and we find that a positive act of our will, but also reinforced and strengthened by what we say with our mouth, may be necessary to close that door. So when people have uh, occult objects, books, and materials, they should be destroyed. You see how people did that in Acts chapter 19. Uh, don't give them away. Don't sell them because you don't want them to ensnare others. Trust the Holy Spirit. Uh, to suggest avenues for prayer. In the case of drug and alcohol abuse, a person has to be willing to walk away from all of it. And just as in the case of occult objects, be willing to get rid of all drugs and drug paraphernalia. 
In cases of sexual sin, the sin has to be repented of and unclean practices renounced and these soul ties and connections with people broken and renounced between persons. If you have mementos, you have objects that remind you of your former romantic partners or remind you of uh, sinful liaisons that you've had or practices, you should destroy and get rid of those things. That goes, I hope it goes without saying, that goes for all pornographic material or anything else that you know that could cause you to experience sexual temptation. And of course, in addition to those um, five areas, there may, be, there may be some other sins, of course, that the person needs to confess and renounce. So as a demonic presence becomes apparent, um, command any demons to leave in the name of Jesus. If there are known curses, cancel them in the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood. If the demon doesn't respond, um, we will command it to do so. Ask the Holy Spirit for insight as to what types of demons may be present. You may not know its exact name, but believe God to give you a functional name and to give you a battle plan through um, words of knowledge that the Holy Spirit will give, words of wisdom, discerning of spirits. So something I want to clear up because I hear people say this and ask about this, it is not necessary to know the actual name of a demon. Right? For example, Jesus didn't go around calling demons by their names, you know, hey, Bob and Seth and all this. He simply cast them out by saying deaf and dumb spirit. That's a functional name. You don't get into the weeds with demons and debate with them and try to outsmart them intellectually. Um, be sure, though, from the pastoral standpoint, be sure the person knows that you're not speaking to them. You're speaking to the spirit that's harassing them. Sometimes in, uh, in a stronger case, you see a person's personality gets submerged, really, so that you can't even talk to the person directly, but you can only talk to the demons. So if necessary, um, you know, you might have to command a demon to release that person so that you can talk to the person directly. But I, I want to caution you, if you find yourself, you know, in a situation, some emergency of prayer where you have to, to deal with this situation, be very cautious about conversing with demons. Remember, they lie. Okay? Jesus said that the devil is the father of lies. Um, let the Holy Spirit tell you when the deliverance is accomplished because the demons may be faking it. You have to be sensitive to the Spirit. And if you're engaged in a scheduled session with someone, if you're part of that, there may be more than one meeting that's required. Um, when we minister in the authority of Christ, it means just that. We're ministering in the authority of Christ, not our own authority. Uh, I want you to know that demons fear and they respect Jesus Christ. Um, we are nothing, you know, as human beings. Uh, we're Christians. Uh, maybe they can spot us because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. We look different from people who don't know Jesus to them, I suppose. But demons don't fear and respect us. They fear and respect Jesus Christ in his name. And every time that we see a demon cast out, it only increases our faith in the name of Jesus because we see that they have to respond to and obey his name. So you may need to be firm, but it is not necessary to shout or scream or engage in theatrics. Don't be rattled by manifestations of demonic power or behavior. If necessary, make the demons be quiet. That is, by the way, uh, let me pop a religious balloon here. By the way, that is all that rebuke means, right? I hear people all the time running around saying, I rebuke you, I rebuke this, I rebuke that, I rebuke the spirit of flat tire, whatever, right? People just do that in its religious language, but literally all that rebuke meant there in the Gospels was to, to muzzle or make someone be quiet. That's all it means, do with that what you will. So um, their actions at times can be unpleasant, but you know what? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Um, pray, number eight there, pray until you're finished. Let God tell you when. So recognize that some cases are harder than others. Again, Jesus said so. Some spirits are weaker than others. Some spirits are truly vicious. And when the enemy's hold on a person is weak enough, you might sense then the Holy Spirit leading you to just give a, a sort of general command 
that will expel any remaining demons. Um, as a practical matter, we certainly do find that praying with people in this manner for more than two or two and a half hours at a time is very draining. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with scheduling additional prayer with someone. We also think it's a good idea to pray for inner healing for a person after you're doing this and for them to experience a greater measure of God's love in their life, let God's love heal them, and also pray for the Holy Spirit's filling of the person. Help the person receive uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit if they haven't experienced that. So that's a lot. I didn't know I was going to talk this long. I uh, apologize. Um, just wrap it up here. What happens next? What happens after deliverance? Well, just as we talked about when we talked about prayer for physical healing, a person might need post-prayer directives to help them maintain the deliverance. You might remember from the Gospels, right, that more than one, on more than one occasion, Jesus told a person, go and what? Sin no more. So there is a special danger, as I've already mentioned, for people who have been delivered. The enemy might seek to marshal his forces again to try to attempt a return. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, my own, that this is especially common when there has been involvement in the occult. If you have been delivered out of the occult or if you have a family background in the occult, be aware of the fact that the enemy will want to come back at you because he's probably not happy that you've been set free from this uh, sensitivity to his kingdom, let's call it. Um, Jesus talked about the house has to not only be swept and clean, but has to be filled up filled up with God's presence. You have to begin a new life, a life of faith and worship. You have to be devoted to God's word and to prayer. You have to break behavior patterns that opened a door for demonic influence, right? If you used to be, you know, uh, drinking all the time, you were an alcoholic, well, guess what? Maybe you can't go and say, oh, I'm going to go witness to my friends at the bar. Maybe you shouldn't do that. It's not in the Bible, but it's wise anyway. You know what Ben Franklin said? If your head is made out of wax, don't walk in the sun. So if you know that you have a weakness in a certain area, avoid. And, you know, Christian counseling or counseling ongoing prayer with a pastor may be necessary. We have a problem with the flesh and iniquities. Many people lose, if I could use that term, lose a deliverance, and this is, one of the most important things I'm saying tonight, because the root of the demonic in their life was not completely occultic, but it was about fleshly indulgence. And so if you give yourself again to more carnality like that, it will lead to enslavement again. You know, you can't cast out the flesh. It has to be crucified. You can't crucify a demon and you can't cast out the flesh. How's that? Uh, iniquity in the form of hereditary sins and weaknesses should be broken in the deliverance session and you have to take great care afterwards to avoid those areas. If you come from an angry, brawling, fighting family, you probably have that anger in you and you've probably been trained uh, from your earliest days, you know, unconsciously, subconsciously to react with that flash of anger to things because you were always exposed to that and that's the only way you know how to act when things don't go your way. Those kinds of things are very real. So, and let's say in terms of the occult, because we see so much of it now, I suppose, uh, if you have a lot of occult involvement in your family, you will probably tend to be fascinated by those things yourself. And again, that is the biblical dynamic of iniquity being visited on a person for several generations. We may not really understand how all of that works, but we know that it's real and it can be hard to break when you're not going to be persistent about it. So uh, all of that to say, if you've been delivered out of the occult, you should never ever again dabble with it. Don't even flirt with it. You should avoid all entertainment uh, with horror and occult themes. All right, finally, what if you feel called to this ministry? Um, ideally, you know, as it was in the early church, ideally all Christians should be able to engage in this ministry. But if you're going to engage in this ministry in a regular, uh, in a regular way, it can demand a high level of commitment. 
It can demand a lifestyle that uh, many Western believers, okay, uh, Americans and Europeans, many Western believers do not maintain uh, the lifestyle that is necessary to be effective in this ministry. Um, you may not like that I said that, but, you know, that is the case. But I do want to be quick to say that because God loves people, the Lord will always help you if you should find that you need to perform deliverance on the spot. So don't be surprised if you run into a few of these cases now, from now to the end of the year, simply because you were here tonight and you kind of know what to do now. It's okay to laugh. But if you feel uh, called to engage in this kind of ministry on an ongoing basis, uh, then the best thing to do is speak to the leadership uh, of your church. If you're engaged in deliverance ministry, you never want to work without being under authority, without um, being uh, under oversight, under covering, and you never want to minister uh, in a spirit of, of strife or in a spirit of independence. Remember that the devil fell through pride and ambition. And he is more than capable of spotting it in you and using it against you. So uh, if you are interested in being used in this kind of ministry here, um, you can talk to me, talk to Pastor Ruth about going deeper into that. Uh, as Pastor Ruth and I, that, that deliverance comes under uh, our covering. So I've given you a list of a few books there for further reading. Uh, all of these books uh, I can rent to, recommend to you very highly. There's an, an older book by Neil Anderson, Stephen Beecham. We've actually used his book in a course. Uh, Randy Clark has good materials on this. Chris Hayward as well. And there's a little bit older book now uh, by Derek Prince called They Shall Expel Demons, uh, which, is, which is really an excellent book. So, all right, thank you for uh, sitting through that. That was long. I won't be as long next week. Uh, I don't enjoy talking about this topic because when you even talk about these things, you know, you find yourself being targeted by the enemy because the enemy does not want the word of the destruction of his kingdom uh, to get out. But um, I don't, I don't want to keep you later, but if you can stay just for two or three more minutes, uh, I want to invite you to stand and we'll just pray a, we'll just pray a closing prayer and uh, we'll ask the Lord to help us in these matters. Hallelujah, Jesus. Can you lift your hands? Let's just worship him for a minute. We bless you, Lord. We give you glory, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, tonight that all authority has been given to you in heaven and in earth. Jesus, you said, I'm giving you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. So, Lord, as, we, as, we, as we've talked about these things tonight, Lord, just in the room, uh, maybe some of the things that we were sharing caused people to think about their own lives or to think about the lives of others whom they know who maybe are being affected or afflicted by these things. And, Father, we ask for your grace, Lord. We're all learners in these things, Lord. And we ask you to bring us along, Lord, in these things so that they are no longer a source of, of dread or terror to us. But I pray that you would make us bold in Christ. And I pray that you would strengthen our faith by causing us to remember that in the name of Jesus, God the Father has invested almighty authority. And as we meditate on the power of your name, Jesus, help us to go forth and use your, your name in battle, Lord, not only to heal the sick, but Lord, when the demonic becomes apparent to us, Lord, enable us, Lord, uh, in an unafraid fashion to deal with it. Jesus, you said that deliverance Setting people free from the power of darkness is the children's bread. It is the birthright of everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ. Father, tonight we want to repent, Lord. Uh, any of us who are here, Lord, if any of these things has a lodging place in our heart tonight, Lord, if within any of us there is an unforgiving heart, Lord, or if we've been involved in the shedding of innocent blood, Lord, if we've been engaged in occult practices, Lord, if we've glorified the works of darkness rather than coming to you in pure worship, if we've committed sexual sin or if we've uh, given ourselves over to drug and alcohol abuse, then, Father, we repent of these things. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to cleanse us by Jesus' blood. Lord, your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we know these things are not uh, pleasant to discuss, Lord, but they are a reality, and they are a reality that you have equipped your church. And that means each and every one of us, Lord, not just the pastors, not just the evangelists, Lord, but you've equipped every one of us to be able to operate in these things and see the name of Jesus glorified as people are set free from the grip of Satan and from the grip of evil spirits, Lord. Father, as we um, move forward in this course now, as we kind of shift gears, Lord, we pray that you would uh, begin to teach us in the next couple of weeks, Lord, about revelatory experiences. Teach us about discerning of spirits. Teach us more about spotting the enemy's work. Teach us about the prophetic, Lord. Father, I pray right now for a release of the prophetic, just to prepare, Lord. Father, you promised that in the last days you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. You said that your sons and daughters would prophesy, old men would dream dreams, young people would have visions. So right now, Holy Spirit, we trust you to come, we invite you to come and begin to increase us in our prophetic anointing right now. Lord, we wanna be able to speak to others on your behalf. We ask God that you would release into believers right here, everyone in this room. Father, let there be an increase in the word of knowledge, in words of wisdom, discerning of spirits, prophecy, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. I pray, God, that from this night, just even beginning this week, Lord, before we even start to teach on prophecy next Wednesday, Lord, that people will begin to have divine encounters with you, that you'll give us dreams and visions. Lord, we come against any lie that says that God doesn't do that anymore. Jesus, because you said, my sheep hear my voice. And Lord, we, we trust you. Jesus, you said that if we, um, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we ask you, Lord, trusting that we're, we're not going to receive anything that's false. We're not going to receive anything that's unwholesome, but you're going to help us to be in better communication, better fellowship with you, Lord, as we talked about going all the way back to the beginning of the class, that we would walk in the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Lord. So, so we say, come Holy Spirit, refresh us this night. Thank you for all the ministry that that's been going on in the building, Lord. Thank you for the rising tide of what you're doing out on the streets and what you're doing in this building, Lord. We ask that you would use us as your servants, Lord, to expand your kingdom and to bring fame and glory and honor to the name of Jesus. We pray it all in his name. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody.